I'm taking this video very seriously. I've got my notes and I've got some iced coffee, so let's begin. My name is Ola, I'm a third year biochemistry student at the University of Oxford and I have chosen a really cool topic to discuss today which is anaesthetics. So you probably heard about anaesthetics, you know, it's like a really hard word to spell and also these are really commonly used and really really important drugs which are used for surgeries. There are two types of anaesthetics. We've got local anaesthetics which act locally and then we've got general anaesthetics, which act just on your entire body. We're going to focus on general anaesthetics, but I'll give you a brief introduction to local anaesthetics as well. So if you've ever been to the dentist to get a tooth removed, then you probably had a local anaesthetic otherwise per you because you felt all the pain. So local anaesthetics are things which cause the absence of pain. So it's not a painkiller because painkillers alleviate pain. Local anaesthetics, however, they just make you feel no pain whatsoever. And that's really important if you want to have like a really small surgery, like a tooth removal, or maybe something on your skin that needs to be removed, or just something minor. It's probably a good idea to use a local anesthetic, otherwise it will be very, very painful. And we pretty much know how local anesthetics work. Like we know they're very precise molecular mechanism. This is not the case for general anesthetics. So general anesthetics is what is given a patient during surgery. So when you're about to have your appendix removed, you're much better off not feeling the surgeon during the procedure. So you're given general anesthetic. And apart from just causing no pain sensation to be felt, they kind of put you in like a medical induced coma. And there are loads of different general anesthetics that have been in use for quite a long time. So, you know, when people kind of look back in history for first signs of like surgeries and potential use of anesthetics, they found some in ancient Sumerians, Egyptians, Greek, and in ancient China as well. So kind of all around the globe, people were trying to find ways to do surgeries, which were often life-saving and could be a way to deal with various diseases. And they use like all sorts of different ways, sometimes a bit weird ways, I would say. And then over time, things have developed. Middle Ages were kind of get someone blackout drunk vibe, you know? So they would just use a lot of alcohol to make the person not feel a lot of pain. It wasn't the best solution, I must say, but it was working to the extent that it could be used for some procedures. And then there was a really big breakthrough in the 19th century in Japan. In 1804, there was this Japanese doctor who performed the very first successful surgery using general anesthetics. I'm probably gonna mispronounce the name, so I apologize for that. He was called Hanaoko Seishu, and ever since that very surgery in 1804, anesthetics have been developing more and more. The two main anesthetics you probably heard of, which were developed in that time, I mean 19th century, were ether and chloroform. Some of them are still um, in use, mainly ether, in the countries where the healthcare system is underfunded. And the reason for that is they work really well and they're very cheap. So the fact that they have some side effects, as actually most drugs do, is often compromised because of how cheap they are and how many life-saving surgeries can be performed if these are used. However, since the 19th century where these two were developed, they got some bad press, especially for chloroform, which was shown in the 20th century to be cancerogenic for mice. So ever since, it was not very much used in hospitals anymore. And we have developed such a massive variety of different general anesthetics. We've got NO2, we've got xenon gas, we've got propofol, we've got ketamine. There's loads of different general anesthetics. And as with medicine and drug discovery, we always want to know how they work. So, you know, whenever they do work, because they were discovered empirically by doctors in hospitals, but we really wanted to know how they actually work down to the very molecular size. As you've seen from another video, drugs act by targeting different proteins. So if you know that that's the typical mechanism of drugs, you're trying to find a target for these molecules. But here comes the problem. And there are two theories which explain how general anesthetics work. First of them, 
is the lipid theory. Lipid theory states that these molecules go into the membrane surrounding cells, surrounding neurons, and then they kind of mess up how they transduce signals. So the neurons in the nervous system very much rely on like electric signaling. So it's kind of like a wire in your wall to simplify. They go via waves of depolarization of ions entering the cell. So if you mess up the properties of the membrane, you can mess up the signaling and then you can reduce synaptic signaling, which is the general mechanism of general anesthetics. According to the lipid theory, it's important that these molecules go into the membrane and then that's how they act. There is a lot of supporting evidence for that. There is the meyer overton rule, which says the more hydrophobic a molecule is, the more potent anesthetic it is. So basically, the more something likes fact, the better it works as an anesthetics because you don't need as much to achieve a particular result, in this case, general anesthesia. There's also really weird behavior of halothane, which is one of the anesthetics and it doesn't follow typical drug curve for how it works. What I mentioned before, there's so many different molecules, as you can see, that's really hard to predict like a single target that they act on because they're so different that it would be really hard for such a massive variety of molecules to bind to a single target and then result in anesthesia. However, there is some evidence for the second theory, which is the protein theory, saying these drugs work as every other drug does, so they bind to proteins, they just bind to a lot of different proteins. There is some evidence for that because, first of all, we have crystal structures of these anesthetics bound to different ion channels. So we know some of them bind to ion channels, that's good evidence. And then the second thing is there's one anesthetic which is called isofluorine. It exists in two different 3D forms. If you've done organic chemistry in two different stereoisomers, meaning it's the same molecule just can adopt two different 3D shapes. So 3D shapes are really important for proteins but are not so important for membrane. And the fact that the two different 3D shapes of that molecule behave differently suggests that they actually target the protein, not the membrane. So you might think that it's really weird that a drug acts on many different targets, but it's actually quite common for drugs which were discovered a very long time ago. So now if you discover a drug, you want to target this like protein which is involved in this type of disease. However, earlier it was more like a trial and error, so they were just looking for molecules, then the molecules were shown to work, and then we started thinking, how does it work? So it's kind of the opposite order. And for example, aspirin, which you've used most likely, I've used it quite a lot, it's known to bind to many different targets because it was developed as a drug that achieved its function, but when its mechanism was investigated, it was actually shown to act via many different targets. So it's not that uncommon for drugs to target many different proteins within the cell. So these are the two theories underlying general anesthesia. No one really knows what's the case because there's evidence for both theories. Let me know down in the comments if you think one of them is more convincing. That being said, I hope you enjoyed this little episode about anesthetics. I have way more to share about other biochemistry related topics. So if you'd like to hear more from me, check out my own YouTube channel, Ola the Explorer. And I hope you're all staying safe and I'll see you next time.